Isn't that great? If you've noticed, we've changed a few things. Instead of running a different video every Sunday morning, throughout the series, we stay with the same video. And, and I don't know about you, when Susan and I were raising our kids, there was this uh, children's author I called Richard Scary. And he found the best way to teach kids is through repetition. So kids, we are trying to teach you <laughs> through repetition. And the end tag is, we're glad you're here because we are glad you're here because we have good news of Jesus Christ who resurrected for each and every one of us, amen? Well, it's been an interesting sermon series. Today, we put the capstone on our series on Nehemiah. And I was um, talking to our holy rollers over here, um, Fern and them, holy rollers are ladies with their strollers. Um, They named themselves, I didn't do it. I know better than pick fights with elderly ladies. You're, you're never going to win. And, and so we have the golden girls, and behind them are the holy rollers. Hey, I'll, I'll give everybody a name before we're done. But you know, this week, I, I don't know if you've known, out of four weeks, I did not have my voice, three out of four. I, I still don't have my voice back. It's light, it's airy. I broke my finger. I have this horrible wart on my hand. Um, I have sinus pressure. I cough all night long to the point I'm gagging. This week, my blood pressure um, started out 171 over 97 or something. And I know Mary came in, she's gonna scold me yesterday. It was 184 over 97, it's getting worse. And honestly, my lungs are clear. I don't have a cold. I don't have bronchitis. I wish I did. I've been taking antibiotics, and trust me, this is as good as I'm getting. I'm sorry. But, you know, it was, Ethel prayed for me. The devil just get out of my life. Sometimes it's easy to see how the devil gets in our lives. Sometimes he comes in the different ways, doesn't he? I mean, we sure love to talk about God, but it's almost like we, we don't believe the devil exists. But he does. He'll come in the way of taking my voice so I can't preach at you, I mean preach to you every week. He'll come in the way of your children breaking your hearts. He'll come in the way of taking your jobs, taking your joy. Men, when we lose our masculinity, ladies, when you lose your youth, I think you're more beautiful just so you know. But you ever notice that the devil just tries to take things from us, to keep from us having hope in God and in Jesus Christ. In the story of Nehemiah, and I feel like the story of this church, in Nehemiah, Jerusalem's walls go down, and really, when you look at Jerusalem, the the greatest thing in the Old Testament in the city was the center, was the temple, the church. And once they tore down the walls, it was easy to tear down the temple. It was very easy to tear down um, God's house. And, you know, when Susan and I first got here, We heard about the heydays in the 70s and 80s and how great they were. The problem is when the past is the hero. All we do is talk about the good old days. Oh, when I was young, I could lift 50 pounds with each hand. Oh, when I was young, I looked like a model. Oh, when I, you know, we we always talk about how the past was so great. Folks, today is a good day. No matter what, the past is not the hero. Jesus is the hero. Not you, nothing you build. I mean, if we really believe that heaven is real, the future is the hero. And there's great days ahead. There were great days ahead for for Jerusalem, for, for Nehemiah and Ezra and all the people who stood with him. And there are great days for our church too. That's why we had vision night. Listen, just like with Nehemiah, and and we read last week that beside him and beside her and next to him and and next to her, the people stood together. Folks, if we want to rebuild this great kingdom, we need to stand with each other and not expect someone else to do it. We must be beside each other. So if you've not turned in your pledge cards, I beg you, because it's more than your money, It's about a commitment where you say, you know what? Now is the time that we will work together for God's kingdom. When you don't fill out a pledge card, you don't show up. It's just saying, I'll let someone else do the rebuilding. I did my time. I did all my effort. Could you imagine if that was the case in Nehemiah? 
there wouldn't even be a book of Nehemiah. It would have never been accomplished. But when the people work together, when the people come together, I believe our story now is written in the new chapters in heaven. And I want you to be part of it, amen? I want there to be a church not only for us today, but our kids and our grandkids and the next generation and the next generation. And I don't want to believe that the, the past is the hero. I believe the past is the past. And it's a beautiful story, but I believe it's still getting written. I believe that you and I, our ceiling at our best should be the floor in which our children start. Amen? You're quiet now, aren't you? Do me a favor, close your eyes. Humor me. How would this church look in a month from now? Keep your eyes closed, but look around. Look and see what your Sunday school classes could look like in a month from now. Your small groups, your ministries, your home. When those prodigal children come back, when the Lord blesses us in all we do, does it look beautiful? Helen Keller was once asked this. She was suffering from being blind and deaf. She was asked, what's worse than being blind? And she quickly answered, having sight, but not being able to see. Think about that. Having sight, but not being able to see. The Bible constantly talks about vision and dreams because God wants you to see past where you're at today. Do you understand that? Every person who had a vision in here and everyone who's had a vision in here, the vision was not current, it was futuristic. It was for somewhere God wanted to take you. And it's just not for your church. It's for your personal life. It's, it's for your family life. It's for your work life. God wants to take you further than you could ever imagine. So when you closed your eyes and you seen something, it would only be small in comparison to what God wants to do. But husbands and wives, you must stand beside each other, beside him, beside her, with your children, with your coworkers, with your small groups, with your Sunday school classes, with your church. It's when we come together. Listen, we're better together than we are when we're alone. And we stated Sunday night that this is our new salvation candle. When someone in this congregation leads someone to Christ, we need to light this. Anybody today? I did some research this past week, and I'll get to the sermon here in a minute. Lunch is until noon. I did some research. It was interesting that this current generation is most, one of the most challenging generations. If we back up the last 40 years, right? Most of you were teeny boppers 40 years ago, right? But over the last 40 years, we've had people like Billy Graham, right? Um, with Harvest Festival. Uh, Greg Laurie. Oral Roberts, Kenneth Copeland, and we've had these great evangelists doing all this work for us. Doing all this work for us. And so this is a generation that grew up never learning evangelism, not knowing how to evangelize, nothing else. We had TV evangelists, we had radio evangelists, newspaper, we had all these people evangelizing for us, so we never engaged in it. And now the church sets where it is. Go back to that generation before. That was the generation that built these great churches. Who told people about Jesus Christ and his resurrecting power. It was that generation that told people about the power in the blood of Jesus. It was that generation who built these beautiful temples. It was them. And folks, now it's our turn. It's our turn to rebuild the temples. But we must engage in leading people to Christ. And you do that by telling people that Jesus loves them. Amen. How he died for them. Not telling people that you're going to go to hell because of your ways. Right? And so I lead by example. So Susan gives me a hard time. 
when I go to the gym. Um, because I go to the gym and I see it as my mission field. So she makes fun of me when we go in, uh, this person saying hi. and that I probably say hi to 10 to 20 people by the time I hit the locker room. So it's like a social club for me, almost like church, right? Um, and so the other night we get done working out and Susan and I are sitting in a hot tub. We, if, if we had a hot tub at home, we'd never go to the gym. Um, so I, I think we work out just to justify to go to the cesspool called the hot tub. And we're sitting in the hot tub and the, the same thing happens. The staff knows what happens and I will instigate somehow myself into a conversation. And sooner or later, the same question arises, which I, I'm a fisher of men. And I'm baiting them, and the question come up. There was this big guy, and he's not here, um, and a couple other people. And so I engage in this conversation. Finally, I, I set the hook. The guy asks, so what do you do? And inside, I have this big old smile. I was like, I'm a pastor. He goes, oh, you are. Hey, I have a question for you. And I'm like back and forth, and we're back and forth, and pretty soon he goes, where, do you, where are you a pastor at? I'm like around the corner over here. He goes, I'm coming Sunday. Next service, a gentleman named Lance will be here because I believe in leading by example. Amen? Nehemiah led by example. Last week when we read, not only is Nehemiah telling people how to rebuild the wall, but if you remember in, in chapter uh, five, he was rebuilding the wall himself. As a leader, it doesn't mean we give orders. You never ask someone to do what you're not willing to do yourself. Amen? Join me in Nehemiah chapter eight. This is a, a great crescendo of everything that goes on in this rebuilding. I absolutely love it. There are some things that mimic our lives, our church, our history, and our future in this chapter. It says, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women. Ladies, that's a good place to say amen. All who are able to understand. And he read it from daybreak till noon. I get 30 minutes. As he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of men and women. Amen. And others who can understand. All the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Are you listening? Attentively. As you're the teacher of the law stood on a high wooden platform. Good morning. I'm right here. Beside him on his right was Metelachash, Shema, Anani, Uriah, Hilkaziah, Mishaiah, and on his left were Padiah, Meshal, Malkaljah, Heshem, Hashbadanan, Zechariah, and Melashem. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. Remember, I'm up here. And he opened it. And the people all stood up. Why are you sitting? Ezra praised the Lord, the great God. All the people lifted their hands. No. And all replied, amen, amen. amen. All, right, all right, good morning. And they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their face to the ground. The Levites, now these are the preachers. Jeshua, Bani, Sherebim, Jamin, Akuba, uh, Shebedatha, Hodiah, Meshiah, Kelita, Azariah, Joazbad, Hannah, and Padella instructed the people of the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so the people understood what was being read. And then Nehemiah, the governor, what? Nehemiah got a promotion. Ezra, the priest and the teachers of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, this day is holy to the Lord our God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people have been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, go. And enjoy choice food and sweet drinks. And send to, send to some of those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of our Lord is your strength. Your strength, not, not someone else's. 
Now, believe it or not, just these 10 verses, I could probably preach 20 different sermons because there's so much good stuff in there. But when we look at it, they, it is estimated there were 50,000 people there that day. Ha! Huh. A new church start. A church plant. A, a, a re, restructured church. And the first Sunday, 50,000 people show up. Oh, we'd all be celebrating, wouldn't we? Listen, and they weren't anxious to go. Ezra was reading from sun up till noon. And people wanted more. Now I get 30 minutes and the minute this goes like this, everybody else starts doing this. I'm thinking about things like fried chicken, donuts, potlucks, or buffets. Lindy's favorite. There was a joke in there somewhere. But here's what's interesting. Here's where it compares with us. It says whenever Ezra was reading the word of God, the people wept. Do you know why they wept? It was because they realized originally they had turned Jerusalem and the temple into their social club. It was about having concerts and about whose name was who and who had the money in the church and who was in charge of the ministries and who was a big wig and who was this and who was that. Does that sound familiar yet? And so when they heard the word of God being read, they, they heard things like, be humble, love, submission, restoration, take care of the needy, the poor, the widows, the orphans, not ourselves, and the title in which we give ourselves. Those were the things that destroyed Jerusalem and the walls and the temple. Because cancer starts on the inside and makes its way out. I don't think I need to say much more than that, do I? It's hard for us to understand that many churches suffer the same as Nehemiah and what happened there. But when you see yourself in there, you weep. But when you move forward and you see what's done to rebuild, you begin to cheer. And that's why Nehemiah said, stop crying. And so church, stop crying over the past. Our past is not our hero. The past is a past, and it's a great past. It's a history worth smiling about. But folks, God is not done. The walls have been rebuilt. I don't know if you've looked back over the last three and a half years. I love when people come who haven't been here in years, and they come back like, what is going on in this church? It's a different church. This is a great church. And you know when they say it's a great church, they're not saying Brad's, Brad's a great preacher, right? I, I haven't heard that. I'd like to hear it every once in a while. But they say, these are great people. They're smiling. They're happy. They're joyous. They're working together. They're talking about you. You are a great church. You are a great people. Hey, stop crying over the past. It's the past. We all make mistakes, right? We all get full of ourselves, right? Everybody got quiet on that one. Past is past. You know, I, I, I teach people. In the 80s, you couldn't get a job with IBM. That if somewhere on your resume, you had not been fired or failed. Because they wouldn't hire someone who didn't know that feeling of failure. Because when you feel that sting for anyone in here been fired, that hurt, didn't it? And you work really hard to make sure that never happens again. And I believe this great church, you're gonna work hard to make sure we don't go anywhere but up. I was talking to one of our saints this morning. She was kind of down and out. Said, I got to get up. It's the only thing I could say good. I was like, good. If you're pretty low, there's nowhere up, no place to go but up, right? It's all about how you see things. You can twist anything negative or positive. It's your choice. It's not the world's choice. Susan and I were having this debate yesterday. How do you see things? Do you see things as a positive movement forward or just a negative tumble back? 
It's really in your hands. Truthfully, it's really in your head. It's how we see things. Uh, the Bible is always talking about this. When you and I have a vision, when Nehemiah had a vision, and last Sunday night when we had a vision, or maybe you have a little boy and you're growing him up and he's looking good, man. He's got great hair, right? You have a vision for his future. When you, we raise our kids, we have a great vision for their future, right? When we have a great vision for our church, we, we're thinking about the future. When we think about what we do or our vocation and our callings, we're thinking about the future. And we, in week two, we talked about sometimes you don't tell everybody about your vision. Not everybody's gonna understand it. Not everyone's gonna get involved in it. Not everyone's gonna conceptualize it. Why? Because it's your vision. It's not everybody's vision. That's yours. So a minute ago, I had you close your eyes. And I had you look around emotionally what your vision of this church, your home, your small groups, your Sunday school, what it was. And I'm gonna tell you, write it down like an architect or maybe like a testimony. Write it down so you don't forget your vision. Joseph's vision were really colorful, weren't they? Oh, I just wish I had a coat like that. Maybe I'll get Ian to make me one. By the way, today's Ian's birthday. Make him embarrassed, please. But here's what another great prophet in the Old Testament said about visions. It's in Habakkuk 2, 2 and 3. It says this. And then the Lord answered me and said, record the vision and inscribe it on tables or tablets that the one who reads it may run. Right? In other words, here's your vision. Now go get it. Go do it. Stop waiting for this to happen. It just won't happen because you've seen it. You've got to put feet to it. You've got to put hands to it. You've got to put your mouth to it. You know, like a great pastor in Hollywood, right? There is such a thing. He says this. He says this, and I agree. Sometimes we Christians use prayer as an excuse to do nothing. Like we just think we pray and things magically happen. I'm not sure that's what God does. I mean, when it comes to healing. But we've been praying for years for these pews to be filled. We've been praying for this to, to be done for you. Stop praying and start praying and doing. Prayer is a lazy excuse for spiritual welfare. God expects you and I to pray but then he expects us to do something about it. Right. Amen? I know this is probably that 40-year generation that's not heard that, and that may sting. But remember on Candidate Weekend when Susan and I and Taylor came here? I said, what if I could teach you something you've never heard that would go against everything you've ever been told but would be absolutely aligned with this? Would you want it? That's what you just got. Write your vision down now. Run. Do something with it because there are people going to hell. We have family members going to hell. Run with your vision of the fullness of Christ, not only in our church, but in our cities, in our states, and in our country, and in our world. It's interesting how Christianity is exploding in persecuted countries like China and the Middle East, but dying in America. Those who are persecuted, those who are hungry, are telling people they're running with this while we sit around going, well, I'm, I'm gonna pray right here in my recliner and never do anything about it. See, the Levites and the people had a job to save the world. You and I have a job. I have a vision all people come to know Jesus Christ in our community. What is your vision? I have a vision there is no more suicide in our community. I have a vision that people stop crying at night because of the hurt in their heart. I have a vision that people get rid of insecurities 
and self-doubt and self-worth and depression. I have a vision that all of our prodigal children come home and are sitting with you. We have Doc sitting back there. I have a vision someday to be like you, Doc. As I look to your left, you have four great people who know Jesus Christ because you did more than pray. We're to pray, but then we are to run. See, in our world, we're told to run from problems, run from difficult situations. Make your life really easy. Make as much money as you can. Make your life easy. When we compare America to China, we can see that's actually working in reverse for our faith. I'm a jerk. I will tell people about Jesus in a hot tub. I'll tell people about Jesus in a 184 degree sauna and make them sweat. Even one day I was like, man, you think this room is hot. If you don't know what I mean, come join me in a 185 degree sauna room. You'll find out really quick. But what about you? Remember uh, last week I, I asked, pray for five people. Five people you know going to hell. Have you been praying about it? You know, that's called one of the great church lies, right? When we say, oh, I'll pray for you, but then we forget to. And we repeat that habit and repeat that habit. I think one of the things I love about Pastor Kramer so much, he's always got this little notepad. When we first brought him on staff, he was always writing, I thought he was spying on me. But he was. When I said he took the heart and I've watched him apply it. But you tell him my prayer request, he's writing it down. Have you really been praying for these five people? Does their salvation really mean something to you? Heaven or hell, does that mean something to you? Or is it just one of those things we'll do when we remember? Think about it. You have five people of influence in your life right now. Maybe one of the best things you can do is get over yourself. The Bible talks about something like that, right? Put others first. Submit. Put others first. Let's Lord lead this community, this, this state, this country, this 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 world to Jesus Christ. And we can do it one-on-one. -on -one. I believe these days the best evangelism is one-on-one. -on -one. You want to change the world, start at home. Start in your inner circle. Start to tell people the good news of Jesus Christ. I had a young man the other day, and I'll finish with this story. He grew up hating Christians, pastors. His dad was one. He didn't like his dad. His father and son, they've reconciled and they've become very close over the last year and a half, two years. But the son still is persecuting Christianity online. And the other day, he talked about, when is people gonna, this great God, gonna stop the Catholic Church from molesting little boys? You know, when you make fun of God, you go right for the jugular, don't you? So I answered, when are you gonna stop talking about it and do something about it? Because God gave free will for them, which is a curse, but yet a blessing. And the same free will he gave to them, they chose for evil. Will you use your free will for good and do something about it? You have free will. Freely give, freely you have received the love of Jesus Christ. When you see a problem in the world, stop complaining. Any fool can do that. A follower does something about it, and that's what Jesus Christ showed us. We have problems in our world, but the truth of it is you and I have answers. I want you to continue to pray for those five people this week. But now I want you to shift gears. Not only pray for them, I want you to also add them, Lord, Give me an opportunity this week. 
to show them Jesus. Not tell them, but to show them. Help rebuild the walls. Maybe the walls you put up in your heart. Maybe the walls you put up in your mind. Maybe the walls between you and family, you and friends, you and coworkers, you and neighbors. Because I believe that our best days are just ahead of us. They're not behind us. And we're going to celebrate greater than we ever did. But we must be beside him, next to her, beside him. As we all work together. Nehemiah did it with men and women and children. Anyone who was willing to lock arms. Church, are you really ready to lock arms this year? Because I believe this is the year of Jubilee for this church. This is going to be a year of greatness. And I pray you get to be part of it. When you see, when your obedience and your personal life matches with what this says. We do more than pray. We pray and run. Run. Jesus did not just sit in the temple. He put feet to prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you. Lord God, we continue to come before you with another song. And Lord God, during the song, let us search for you deeply in our hearts and our minds. Let us search deeply for direction. Let us search deeply for a vision. And Lord God, as great as our vision is, it's small in comparison to what you want to do. You tell us in Nehemiah, stop crying. Stop mourning the past and celebrate today and the future to come because there are greater days ahead of us than the days behind us. Lord God, remind us of that not only in the context of the church but also in the context of our families, our loved ones. And Lord God, most of all, hear our prayers this week. Give us opportunities to rebuild your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us at Long Beach Nazarene. If you enjoyed the message today, please share it with a friend. We know that the gospel has to get out there to everybody. Our call is to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. If you want to partner with us, check us out at lbfnaz.org. And there's a Give Online button there as well. Don't forget to click subscribe. We'll see you later. God bless.